We continue with the introduction to the word, God of light and love. Open our hearts to your message of unity. Open our minds to the light of your wisdom. Open our lives to the call of your spirit. Reveal to us your holy presence. As we listen and learn this day, in the name of Christ we pray, amen. The first reading is from 1 John chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What, will we, what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he, revealed, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has ever seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Here ends the first reading. The gospel reading is from Luke chapter 24, beginning with the 36th verse. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do you doubt? Or why do you doubts arise? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is. I myself, touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witness of these things. Here ends the reading. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Uh, now what? We come through Lent. We celebrated the solemn uh, love commandment that Jesus gave us on Monday, Thursday, and we've recalled the agony and pain of Good Friday, and we rejoiced at the resurrection on Easter Sunday, just like we do every year. So here's a question for you. What's different in your life? What's different in my life because of it? Now what? I think in many ways, We've become too familiar with the patterns of the church year and the story uh, and the stories that it tells. We here at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, uh, members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, we're, uh, uh, you know, we're on the three-year lectionary. And each year, that year is based on a different gospel, but the gospel stories uh, generally, you know, are the same. They're telling, there's some differences, but they're telling the life of Jesus Christ. You know, uh, we hear about the expectation of the coming one, Advent, every winter. We hear about Christ's birth every December. We hear about the transfiguration. We engage in introspection during Lent. That's usually, you know, around early spring. We hear uh, about Jesus' final days, 
his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, his final discourse to the disciples, the agony in the garden, and the pain of the crucifixion. Every spring, we hear about Jesus' miraculous resurrection, followed by weeks of, of the disciples, the followers, uh, trying to get their minds around this new uh, uh, reality. Then we hear about the Spirit descending on Pentecost, birth of the Christian church, followed by several months hearing the gospel writer's account of the ministry of Jesus. Uh, in, in the epistles and some of the readings, we're hearing about the early church and how it's growing. And then we come back to Advent and we hear about the expectation of the coming one. And we, we do it all over again, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. Lather, rinse, repeat. Round and around we go. The disciples, those men, women, and children, those followers of, of Jesus, uh, were tasked, were sent out into the world to share the good news. The good news of Jesus' resurrection, of forgiveness, of new life. And that spread throughout the world. And i got to be honest with you, some of us are no longer really amazed or shocked at some of the twists and turns of the scripture stories in the New Testament. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the fish in today's gospel reading. I mean, who cares if Jesus ate a piece of fish? And who cares that it was broiled? I mean, a nutritionally balanced diet doesn't seem to be necessary for maintaining life after the resurrection. I mean, why did the gospel writer Luke waste uh, precious ink and papyrus to include that detail in the story? Well, i got to be honest with you. Luke wasn't writing to a bunch of jaded 21st century listeners, all right? Luke was writing to a community of persecuted believers roughly, roughly a generation after Jesus' crucifixion. These are people like us who never actually witnessed all of the miracles and the healings and the exorcisms that Jesus did. These were people like us who had only heard a story and wondered what a difference a story would make in their lives, that story. And Luke wanted them, wanted you and I to understand that this is no mere story, that this is real. Early in Luke, if you want to thumb to that, or you can later go and check to see if I'm correct in that, in chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, this is what we get. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Euturia and Trachetanus, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Okay, every one of those people and places would have been familiar to the first hearers of Luke's gospel. These were known as historical facts. It'd be the same as if I told you something happened during the administration of President Biden when Gavin Newsom was governor of California and Elizabeth Eaton was the presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It's verifiable fact. All through Luke's gospel, he includes names of people and places as he tells the amazing story of Jesus' life in a familiar context, okay? This isn't a fantasy world that Jesus was living in. This was your neighborhood. This was my neighborhood. The description of Jesus' crucifixion was detailed and terrible. Jesus really suffered and died. And it wasn't a sweet kind of peaceful sleep of romanticized death. No, real pain, real blood, and a brutal murder, ending in the ultimate finality 
of the body's inability to continue living. In other words, Jesus really died. And the people understood death. They understood crucifixion. They understood that there's no coming back from that. Ever. But Luke says Jesus did. And they're told that fact in the context of names and places that they knew. The well-traveled road between Jerusalem and Emmaus, the town of Bethany, the temple in Jerusalem, all demonstrate how real this post-crucifixion Jesus was and is. Jesus tells his disciples, as you heard in the text, look at my wounds. Jesus says, give me, give me a piece of your lunch. A ghost, a vision, doesn't eat. Jesus really lived. Jesus really died. And Jesus really lives again. And if Jesus' resurrection is real, and then Jesus' life and ministry were real, and if Jesus' life and ministry were real, then his promises are real. And if his promises are real, then repentance and forgiveness for you and I, that's real. That's real. And nothing can take it away from us. There's a story told of a woman who lived in the center of a desolate and hopeless neighborhood. And the woman walked outside of her house onto the street and yelled, love, peace, hope. And the next day, she would do the same thing. She would leave her house, walk onto the street, and yell at the top of her lungs, love, peace, hope. And she would do that every day, rain or shine like clockwork. But one day, the woman's next door neighbor, who was tired of this daily yelling, went out into the street and he confronted her. And he said, hey, lady, you're crazy. What the heck do you think you're doing? Every day you come out of your house and you yell, love, peace, hope. You're a fool. Don't you know nobody is listening to you? This neighborhood is full of hate. This neighborhood is full of crime. No, there is no love of neighbor here. There's no peace. You're not going to find hope. Give it a rest and save your breath. Don't you know that you can't change the world? And she looked at him right in the eyes with a smile on her face. And she said, you're right. My yelling and shouting about love and peace and hope might not change the world. But one thing it will do, it'll stop the world from changing me. Stop the world from changing me. We live in a real world, and so did Jesus. We have real problems. You and I have real struggles. And Jesus Christ meets us in the midst of them. We come to church. We read our Bible. We pray. We meditate. We're not just hearing some nice stories. We're experiencing the reality of God working throughout our history and our lives. In times of old, in times now, and in the future. This is real. Our reality is Jesus Christ is risen, and we cannot let the world take that away from us. Because it can't. We have got to continue to walk out into the streets and say, love, hope, peace, justice, forgiveness, new life. We cannot let the world silence us. We live in the real, real 
resurrection and new life of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah.